praise your name. For endless days we will sing your praise. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose again and trampled death. Lord, thank you so much for your word that it never changes. That it's alive and it cuts like a two-edged sword. Lord, thank you that you, you didn't leave us to work all this out ourselves, but you left us your word. And more important than that, you left us your spirit who takes the word and applies it to us. And Lord, uh, we look forward to what you have to say to us this morning and give us ears to hear. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We'll ask our ushers if they'll receive the morning offering. I failed to mention before that there will be a, a prayer time tomorrow night at 645 in the house of prayer up here for the Richardsons in Bosnia and also for, for Alex and uh, Austin who are still there and will be flying back uh, soon. So 645 tomorrow night in the house of prayer. It's time for our kids to go to their place of worship. You see this guy with, right, with his hand raised? If you will head his direction. For those of you who may be new to Living Hope, this is Kevin Stout. Did your bride leave you? <laughs> This beautiful bride, would you stand? This is Caroline Stout. She was on. It's like I said the first service, you married way over your head. I appreciate Kevin's zeal and his heart for God. It's rare uh, to see a guy uh, at his age have such a passion and maturity and a heart for God, and I really appreciate Kevin. And more than that, he walks in humility. I love that. Uh, God loves that. So he's gonna bring the word to us this morning. Uh, let's pray. Lord, I, before I, I pray for Kevin, I pray for David and Andy and Robert, that you would protect them as they go from Uganda to Malawi. And Lord, would you preserve David's voice? Would you use them? to encourage, would you use them to teach, and would you use them uh, to bring people into the kingdom with your word. Uh, Lord, I pray for this service right now that you would give, that you would orchestrate Kevin's thoughts and you would communicate through him exactly what you have for us this morning. I bless this man and I thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Well, hey guys. Um, so my name is Kevin Stout. I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, the fan club's on the front row here. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to need your help today because in the first service, I guess the coffee hadn't kicked in yet. Or maybe, I don't know, the rain that happened a couple days ago was making people dreary. But it's okay to respond. It's okay to affirm or say no or like raise a hand it's okay i need that i'm used to talking to teenagers for only 20 minutes and so i get to talk to y'all for an hour and a half oh <laughs> i was wondering who was listening i think i only got like five of y'all with that <laughs> well thank god i'm not talking for an hour and a half because yeah i don't want to do that um but uh in all sincerity, please do be praying for David and Andy and Robert Sakandi and Alex and Austin as they're all in the field this week. And I love watching our mission statement be lived out by the leadership of this church. It's really exciting to be at a church that not only preaches something, but actually lives it out. And um, I'm very thankful for the elders and the rest of the staff here who took a chance on a young guy four years ago uh, when other people wouldn't and um and now we're here today and so uh we're going to be in john chapter 9 and so we're making our way through the book of john for those of you who maybe this is your first time or you've missed a few 
few weeks or something. Um, and we're, we're trying to find out who the true Jesus is. We're, the title of the series is called Experiencing the True Jesus. And I'm really excited. Uh, this passage, when David asked if I would preach it, I asked him, I was like, are you sure? Because if you know David, if you've seen David, he gets really excited sometimes. Like, how many of y'all, when he starts getting down one step, you're like, uh-oh, and then he gets down another step, and by the time he hits the floor, you're like, I don't know what's about to happen. <laughs> I, I feel like that every time I see it. I'm like, all right, I, get, I, I bet five bucks he's on the floor by 20 minutes in the sermon. <laughs> but uh, because what happens in this passage is really unique. Um, I'm going to read the first five verses. You can stand if you want. Um, I'm in the ESV. And in uh, John chapter 9, verse 1, it says, As he passed by, that he being Jesus, he saw a man blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Thank you, Lord, for those words. And so you can take a seat now. Um, the first point that I saw when I was preparing this, and I'm going to modify if you're one of those who likes to fill out the blanks, um, I may forget to give you all the blanks. Don't hate me for that. <laughs> but the first one is that circumstances do not always determine causes. So circumstances do not always determine causes. Now we know if I get on the loop and I'm headed home today and I do 80 miles an hour, we know that my choice in my circumstance was the cause for me getting a speeding ticket. We know that, right? But the thing is, is that there are times in our lives when bad things happen and we want to point the finger at something or someone or some event or some circumstance or some unfair treatment of somebody. But sometimes God is the originator of that pain in our life. Sometimes God is the one who puts that issue, that discomfort, that whatever it could be in your life, maybe that frustration, that thorn in your flesh, he's the originator of it because pain can be a refiner that molds us into the men and women that we need to be in order to fulfill this thing called the good works which God prepared beforehand that we read about in Ephesians chapter 2. And I love Ephesians chapter 2 because it's actually the verses that God used to bring about my salvation. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing. It is the gift from God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. And those verses are great, but this is the next verse 10 is the part where I think it takes it a whole nother level. It's not just that God loves us, it's that God loves us and has orchestrated us and given us a part in his plan. Because God could have just brought about our salvation and never given us the joy of this thing called a calling or these good works, right? And in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And those good works sometimes are the result of hard pressure, right? How many of you have ever seen a diamond in person? Why is not everybody raising their hand? <laughs> okay, the interaction thing. Let's go, guys. We can wake up. It's okay. I know I know. normally we don't have to like get moving, but it's totally okay to like respond. But you've seen a diamond. And how, who can shout out how a diamond is formed? Pressure, right? I am not that smart of a guy, and I'm not a scientist, but I can only imagine the pain it takes to change and transform at the elemental level into a diamond. <coughs> it's the same thing that Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, where he says, In this you now you, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you 
have been grieved by various trials. If necessary, you have been grieved by, pre by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it perishes by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the name and revelation of Jesus Christ. Though now you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so those hard times we go through, when we want to point the finger at somebody, when we want to point the finger at something, when we want something to blame, Jesus gives us an answer that the circumstances do not always determine the causes. That sometimes the circumstance is actually a gift from God in order to bring about the works of God so that the, He can receive the glory of God so that the kingdom of God can come down and it can reign here on earth. And we see this in this man's life. I love that uh, Jesus, or the, that the scripture does not reveal this man's name. I think that's important. Because it's not about the healing. It's not about the guy who got healed. It's about Jesus. It's all about him. And it's always going to be about him. And so when we look at this story... I see the same story of people like Job and Moses and David and Paul. But my favorite story of somebody who got dealt a bad hand, who didn't deserve it, who had every reason in the world to say, nah, I'm done with this God stuff, was Joseph. And you, if you've read some of the Bible, you may have heard the story of Joseph, but I'm going to give you the Kevin version of it. So Joseph is a dude who's got a bunch of brothers. And Joseph's father, anybody know who that was? Jacob, yeah. Jacob loves Joseph and has favor on Joseph. So what, do, what does any good brother who wants the love of his father, who doesn't have the love of Christ in him do? He tries to discredit his brother. He tries to beat his brother up. Well, they actually took it a whole other step forward. They sold Joseph into slavery. That is some pain. I mean, me and my brother used to fight a lot. Like, like it was bad at times. But like, I never once thought of getting rid of my brother and selling him into slavery. Like, I, that never crossed my thought, my path. But imagine being Joseph. Your brothers sell you out into slavery, and then you end up in the king's hall. And you meet this lady of the night, and you say, no, 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 that's a bad, no, 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 don't get near me, stay away, I don't want any of that. And you do the right thing, so you make the right choice, and then guess what happens after you make the right choice, after you've been sold into slavery? You get thrown in jail. Man, that's a bad hand, isn't it? And then, on top of that, you're there so long, they forget you're in jail. That's an even worse hand. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then, you find out that all of this happened just so that God would place Joseph in the perfect place so that he could enter into Pharaoh's life and speak truth and gospel and love into his life. But we don't like comfort. I mean, we, sorry, we don't like discomfort, right? Like, we, we love our gadgets and our comfort. We love our AC. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love it. We love our heat. We love our sofas. We love our lazy boys. We love our TVs. We love gadgets, right? But the thing is, is there's this pastor named Matt Chandler who has this quote that I think is Awesome. And the quote says, Comfort is the God of our generation, so suffering is seen as a problem to be solved. How many of you guys are like me? And when you find a problem, you get focused. You want to fix that problem. I'm a big fixer. It gets me in trouble sometimes. Not going to lie. My wife gets mad when I get so focused on a task that I can't get my mind off of it until it's complete. 
If you've ever worked <laughs> with somebody like me, you know it can be frustrating. <laughs> Because we get so focused. But the thing is, is that comfort is the God of our generation. And I, I believe that. And speaking from my generation. So suffering is seen as a problem to be solved. And here's the rest of the quote that's so perfect. And not providence from God. You know, sometimes we got to go through the hard times so that we can relate to somebody. So that we can tell them about Jesus. That's so true. I love, love seeing the guys from Fresh Wind sell out for Christ. Because you know what? They get to talk to people that we're never going to get to talk to about who Jesus is. Right? It's true. I love seeing parents of students start telling their friend, their children's like friends' parents on sports teams or clubs, whatever, about Jesus. Because guess what? We can't talk to them. They're not going to come in the building. And so sometimes you've got to go through the pain. You've got to see the sovereignty of God through a really difficult situation, through a hand that you did not deserve to get dealt, in order for the good works that God has prepared beforehand to be presented to you so that you can step in them and that you can fulfill them. So that the glory of God may be shown and the will of God may be declared and manifested and Matt Chandler, he says that quote, and it's easy for somebody to say the quote when they've never gone through anything hard. But Matt Chandler got diagnosed with brain cancer in his early 30s or mid-30s. And he had three kids leading an extremely large church in Texas, and it was growing very quickly. The Spirit of God was on the church. The Spirit of God was on Matt. He's one of my like, pastoral mentors I listen to and I read leadership things from him. But this quote was written post-diagnosis. That's, that's a different kind of power in that quote, isn't it? When you're looking death in the face, and I don't have biological children of my own, but I can only <coughs> imagine the pain of my wife, losing my wife if I were to be diagnosed with cancer and being able to say that God is enough in that pain. And the same thing with this man's life. We have modern examples outside of Scripture besides Matt Chandler. Horatio Spatford. Anybody know who that dude was? He wrote the hymn, It Is Well. It's actually my favorite hymn. You, and the reason it's my favorite hymn is because Horatio had a bad hand. He lost his son. Then he lost most of his business in a giant fire in Chicago. And then he lost his wife and his four daughters all in the same moment. And then he wrote it as well. That's powerful stuff. Jesus, this Jesus stuff isn't fake. Like you can't fake that, right? How many of you have ever heard the term fake it till you make it? I used to be like that. When I was early in high school, I thought I was a Christian. I thought it was because I was a good person. And I faked it. I was on the FCA leadership team. I was leading Bible studies. I was doing all this stuff. But guess what, guys? My heart was as dead as this stand right here. Because I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I missed the point. It's the same thing that the Pharisees do. Right in response to this. And so, in picking up in verse 6 of John chapter 9... We see, having said these things, which this is, by the way, is gross. <laughs> he spit on the ground and made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. I thought of trying to use that as a sermon illustration. I just couldn't bring it to myself to spit in the mud and put on someone's face. And there's no way I would let someone do that to me unless he's Jesus. And then in verse 7, he said, And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Which means sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? The second point, just because you can see doesn't mean you have sight. So listen to what happens next. Jesus meets a guy. A miracle occurs. The glory of God is shown. 
And then watch what happens. Because they missed the point. In verse 9 it says, Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. From the start, people didn't believe that God was in the healing. From the start, people didn't believe that God had moved in that way to touch that man. And then, as we continue reading in verse 10, so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? That's one questioning. He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again, time number two, how he had received sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Skip down to verse 19. And the Pharisees don't like his answer. So they go get the parents. They're trying to disqualify what happened in this person's life. They're trying to disqualify a move of God, this being a, a physical healing. And in verse 19, they say, is, they've got the parents of the blind son. They say, is this your son who you say you was born blind? How then does he see? Time three, they're trying to discredit the work of God. Verse 24. So for the second time, the Pharisees called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. There's going to be times in our lives when the Holy Spirit does something in someone's life and it's going to make us squirm. If you come to Living Hope, you're probably going to squirm. I, as a staff member, have squirmed several times. <laughs> yeah, I, how many of you have ever seen Pastor David's window analogy? So David has this great analogy, and he's got a window. And he talks about the window is like our life, and the, the wind is like the Holy Spirit. And so in order to receive the Spirit, you have to allow the window to open. You have to make the choice to allow God to move in your life. Yes, we do believe in God is holistically sovereign, but we also believe that He, for some reason, I don't know why, He gives us a choice. I guess in his sovereignty, one day I'll know. I still don't understand. One day, maybe. But we have to have a screen. Because how many of you have ever left the windows out open and a rainstorm came? I have. How many of you have ever left your truck windows down in the, in the day and you come back and they cut the grass at the doctor's office and there's dust all in the car now? I have. You know why? Because there was no screen. There was nothing stopping the dirt, the nastiness, the filth from the world entering into your life at that point. And David, the reason I love his analogy is because this is the screen. The 66 books that God ordained to be written down to reveal his love and his character and his glory and his knowledge to us. That's our screen. And so when we get uncomfortable... When we see something happen, it's easy to discredit it, right? Nobody's ever tried to discredit something that was uncomfortable? <laughs> I have. I've done it in this church. <laughs> I used to think that people, when I read in the Bible that people danced in church, I used to think that that was just crazy, right? Uh oh, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Jerry knows where this is going. I used to think it was so crazy. I was like, man, they're just trying to get, you know, they're just trying to make themselves look good. They're just trying to have a good time. They're not glorifying the Lord right then. They're not enjoying the Lord. That's all in their own flesh. But guess what, guys? God opened my window and he revealed to me that my heart of stone was still being chipped away and softened. I remember, and I asked Frida if I could share this. We have a church member named Frida, and I love her so much. 
And in one service, this was like a year and a half ago, Frida felt the Spirit of God move and she danced in church. And I was sitting right over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like literally right where you're sitting. And I was like, oh, uh-uh. Mm -mm. You better sit back down, girl. No, what you doing? And I didn't understand. I didn't believe it. I was letting my religiousosity inhibit God's movement. How many of us have ever missed God because it was uncomfortable? I have. And guess what, guys? A week, what was it? A weekend, 11 days ago, 11 days ago, I was at summer camp experiencing the most spirit-filled worship in the United States that I've ever experienced in my life. And guess who at that time was dancing? Right? Y'all, and I like dancing, but it, back in the worship, I, y'all, I used to be the guy who would stand the silent chosen. I would stand there like this during worship. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm not knocking that. If that's how you worship, that's beautiful. That's great. That is glorious to the Lord. But when we judge others based off of our, our fleshly experiences and our prejudices, we can sometimes miss God moving. And in that moment last week, I don't know where it came from. I was sitting there. We were singing. And all of a sudden, I started bopping. And you know, I was sitting there bopping around. And all of a sudden, I was spinning in a circle. I'm like, what am I doing? I look like I'm on a, like America's Funnest Home Videos. And then, it was, I've heard, uh, one thing I love about our church here is that we have a lot of really godly men and women who have a ton of wisdom. There's no need for you to ever go outside of this church to find wisdom, I promise you. And I've heard the elders and other people talk about this thing called holy laughter before. And I've discredited it many times in my life. Because whenever something gets outside of my comfort zone, I have four like checklists, like little checks that it has to go through in order for me to know, hey, is this from God or is this not from God? And the first checklist on that list is, is there a biblical precedent for what's happening? And guys, I'm not the brightest. I first to admit that. I'm decently smart, but I'm not the brightest. But I have not been able to find holy laughter in the Bible. It's probably in there. I'm not David. I don't know the word as good as I should. I'm working on it. I'm just 26. I promise I'm working on it. <laughs> but the first thing that we have to see is, is there a biblical precedent for it? And how many of you have ever read the story of Moses when the Red Sea parts? We've all read that, right? We've, or we've heard about it, right? Yes. Well, I there's a difference between reading it and knowing it. David talks about those 12 inches between our mind and our heart. And man, is there ever a gap. It might as well be the gap between here and the sun. Because I used to know the story of the Red Sea being parted. But I didn't trust that God still really had control over the nature. And over the winds and over storms and stuff like that. And guess what? He made me squirm. Big time. Well, I was in Uganda in, 2000, in the summer of 2012. I had the date wrong in the first service. So if you were watching this, I'm sorry. Because I said six years ago in 2014. That was wrong. It's 2000. <laughs> a little bit less. 2012. And I was in Uganda. And we were at this church. And they were commissioning the church. It was the first time the church was going to be open. And it was actually the first time that that people group had ever had the Bible in their own language. They had just completed translating it into that people group's language. So that was, like, we had no idea when we went on this trip that we were going to get to experience this. And that was the first most spirit-filled worship I've ever experienced was that trip, too. But the thing was, 
is that as we started showing the Jesus film and presenting the gospel in their language with the word, the God's 66 book love letter in their hands, I watched this storm brew on the horizon that terrified me. I watched the lightning start. We were in northern Uganda, and we, in this town called Gulu, we had driven for about three and a half, four hours outside of town to get to this little church towards South Sudan. In this storm, and Mom, I never told you about this, don't get mad, because I knew you'd freak out. This storm happens, and I'm watching these lightning strikes, like National Geographic picture strikes, where it hits and it lights up the whole horizon. And you know what I'm thinking in my mind? We're the only metal and the only electricity for about 40 miles. I'm going to die. That's literally, that's all I can think of. I was so scared, I went and sat in the van. I left the church service because I was so scared. My window wasn't just shut, my window was locked. I was making sure nothing uncomfortable was coming in my life. And then the pastor, Pastor George, and the pastor of that church and the intercessors gathered our team and we started praying. And guys, I, I think I know what it feels like to watch the Red Sea part because that storm literally split around us. Not a raindrop on us. For two hours, it passed by us. And lightning on both sides of us. And so there was a difference between seeing and having the sight to see the work of God move. There was a difference between reading it in Scripture and knowing it in my heart to be true and worthy. Because there was a biblical precedent for it. And then the second thing I had to check off my list was, does it align with the heart and character of God? And you know what? I think bringing the word to people groups who don't know God, I think that aligns with his heart. So I had to deal with that in my own heart. I had to do a lot of introspection in that moment. I had to wrestle with my insecurities, with my prejudices, and with my limitations that I had put on God. I had to deal with me hindering God moving. And it's been incredible as he sometimes forced the window open and made me squirm. As sometimes a brother in Christ came alongside me and helped me open that window. But when, when it aligns with the heart and character of God, and there's a biblical precedent for the event happening, the next thing is, does it, does it align with biblical counsel from others? When Alfreda was dancing that time in church, I went to somebody who I think has a lot of wisdom. His name is Jimmy Bamberg. And I went to him, you know why? Because I was wigged out. I was like, oh my goodness, what is going on? That needs to stop. Like somebody put her down in a chair and like strap her down. Like this is just uncomfortable. That's not supposed to be happening in this church. Like how can this happen when I'm here? And I went to Jimmy and he comforted me and he said, it's okay. He probably doesn't even remember saying it's okay. He's got so many little Jimmyisms, we call them, so, so many little one-liners. But I had, to, I had to submit that I don't know everything. Whoa, right, Jerry? I had, I had to decrease my intellect and my expectations in order to allow God to move and for my heart to be filled in that moment. I had to listen to the counsel and the wisdom of others when I was out of my comfort zone not to try to shut something down and miss out on what God was doing. And the last thing is that what is the fruit of the event or the circumstance that's happening? And you know the thing about growing stuff? It takes time. Right? Like, so I do remodels for people four days a week. And I had a lady one time get really frustrated because she wanted this really expensive wood on her mantle. And eventually I had to tell her, I'm sorry, ma'am, but the tree still has to grow before we can cut it down. Because we could not source 
a piece of lumber big enough to, for her to be happy with the size of the mantle. And the same thing happens in our own lives. Sometimes God starts a work in somebody's life and you've got to wait to see what the fruit of it is. When I was in college, I went to UGA and got a degree in corporate finance. And I had several job offers that, according to the world, I would be stupid not to take them. I mean, more money than me and my wife make almost twice over right now. But the thing was is that I felt God call me into ministry. I felt God push me into this zone of uncomfort. And in that time of my life, I had my window. It was cracked a little bit. It wasn't open very much. And I probably had some books leaned up against it, hindering the wind from moving even more. And in that time, God had to break me down and had to refine me like gold and had to put me through the discomfort by losing almost all of my friends my senior year of college due to a breakup because I was dating an idol and I had an idol of friendship. And God had to take both of those away from me. And praise God he did. I never would have ended up here at Living Hope if he hadn't. Because God is the same God in the comfort and the pain as he is when he sold like six cattle and he's bringing in the blessings. He doesn't change. And so I, people, I had people in my life, my senior year of college, the pastor I was serving under and several mentors, they all said, I think you missed, I think you missed what God was saying. I think you're wrong. Like literally, I had like interventions several times <laughs> about it with different people. And they all were saying the same thing. Hey, you, uh, basically they were saying, hey, you're crazy. You didn't go to school for this. But the thing is, is that the people God calls, he's the one who qualifies them. It's not us. Like when, if I go back and meet some people from middle school and high, or high school at my 10 year reunion, I guarantee you there's going to be people who are going to look at me and say, ah, he's probably putting on a show. It's not real. But the thing is, is that our expectations and our qualifications that we put on people, those aren't necessarily always in line with God's. Take the Pharisees, for example. The people around the blind man's life, his closest friends who he had been around, they all said, they were split in half. This is from God. This is not from God. And so what did they do? They went to the smartest people they knew at the time who had the most discernment. And those were the Pharisees. Notice they did not go to God. Big difference. <coughs> Big difference. They went to man's wisdom and not God's wisdom. And the Pharisees did what I tell the students all the time not to do. I tell them all the time, and it came from my dad telling me when I was young. He would say, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And guess what, guys? The Pharisees over and over and over and over and over and over and over again wrecked themselves. And they totally missed Jesus. Totally missed him. Because they were living in their little comfort zone. They had built up their walls. They had nailed their windows shut. They had stocked up on all the supplies that they could. And they had turned religious. It's not enough to come to church on Sunday. It's not enough to just read your Bible once a week. It's not enough to just listen to worship music on Sunday. If you're not living it out seven days a week, then is it really worth living in your own life? I mean, that's a hard statement, and I know some of you might get mad at me for that. But like, if you're not going to live it out on Tuesday morning when you haven't had coffee yet, and nobody's around, and your wife walks out and wants you to make her coffee instead of you coffee first, that's where it's really hard to live it out. That's where it's really hard. But when, when we get uncomfortable, when God does something that makes us squirm, we have to go through that checklist because we, we don't 
don't lean on our own understanding. When we lean on our own understanding, we can very easily miss God's movements. We can very easily miss God's good works that He's prepared for each and every one of us to fulfill. And I want you to know, some, I think there's this lie that has been that I felt when I was in college, and I don't believe it anymore, thank, thanks be to God. But there's this lie that only the super religious people can have an impact on God's kingdom. That is a lie from the pit. Because guess what, guys? David and I and the rest of the staff, we may be here on Sunday and during the week some, but guess what? You have more outreach than we'll ever have. You have spheres of influence, just like this blind man did with his friends and with the group of people around him, with the religious leaders that Jesus couldn't have that conversation with. Well, let me rephrase that. Actually, I take that back. Jesus chose not to have that conversation. I'm sorry. Take that statement back. Jesus chose not to have that conversation. Because recognize, where is Jesus when all of this is going down? After he heals the man, Jesus does what? This is what I think he did. I think he went over, and he leaned against the wall, and just watched, watched it happen. I think he was just watching to see the heart of the leaders at the time. The heart of the people. Did they know Jesus? Did they choose Jesus? Were they sold out for God? Were they allowing God to move powerfully in their lives, in them and through them? And the last, the last uh, point is that God does not adhere to our expectations. How many of you have ever been somewhere and God does something and it makes you really uncomfortable? How many of you have ever done that? It's, it's here in this building. <laughs> Exactly. It's okay to get uncomfortable sometimes because we know that we serve a God who not only wants our best, but he wants his best for us. And that's a much better plan than anything that we can concoct. And so when God moves outside of our expectations, like he did when he healed this blind man, when the Pharisees were like, hey, you can't do this on the Sunday. Hey, we don't like you. You've done something that makes us uncomfortable. And they tried to discredit it. That's oftentimes where God ignites revival. It's been my experience. I'm only 26. But I, I've seen it in the lives of students. I've seen it in Uganda in a church dedication. I've seen it in Guatemala in the slums. I've seen it in Clarkston. But guess what, guys? God doesn't just move in the mission field. He's not limited to outside of the borders. He's not limited to outside of your life. He wants to move powerfully in your life, in you and through you, to accomplish great works which he has prepared beforehand. But the thing is, is that when I was preparing for this message, I really felt that this wasn't supposed to be so much of a theological lesson, but that this was supposed to be an ex exhortation in a building up of the body. To let down our comfort zone, to let down our walls, to open the window a little more, to let God lead us to do something, do something radical maybe, do something crazy. I'm not saying don't like find counsel in the Bible, don't do any, don't say Kevin told me to do this, I did not. <laughs> maybe the Spirit did, but I didn't. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that God still moves here in America. That same church service, that same service, last third or two Thursdays ago when I was at camp, it was the most spirit-filled worship I have ever experienced in my life, by far, in America. Like, it just was. I don't know what it was about it. For the students who were there, you can, you can ask them about it. We had this thing, we call it, um, we call it rainbow worship, where all the schools come together because every grade level is a different color. So it starts orange, red, blue, yellow, green, purple. So we call it rainbow because all the colors are together. 
But we were all together for worship. And it hadn't been raining that day. And it didn't rain after worship. But during that worship, the worship leader called out to God. He said, God, speak to us. Because the whole camp was all about finding our calling, finding our purpose, and preparing for it now. And he said, God, speak to us and reveal to us. And a thunderclap. So loud that I literally heard the rafter shake in the building. Guys, it did not rain that day. I've never heard an audible English voice of God, but I think I heard the voice of God last Thursday. And guess what? It was kind of uncomfortable for me at first. And I was like, whoa, that was weird. And then I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? Yeah, that's exactly. I was trying to miss God moving in affirming that worship service for everybody because of my expectations. I had to allow God to make me squirm in order to allow me to experience the best worship of my life. And some of us, we need to squirm. We need to get uncomfortable. We need to trust that God is working all things for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. We need to trust that in Christ, all things can be accomplished. We need to trust that God in His sovereignty isn't going to allow anything to happen that He can't handle. He will allow stuff that we can't handle. That's the point. And so I want to encourage you Maybe the Spirit is bringing something to remembrance right now. Maybe an event that happened, a life change that happened, a testimony that happened, something that you got really uncomfortable with and you wrote God off in that moment. And I'm going to pray and the worship band is going to come up. But before, before we do that, I just want to take a moment and everybody... Just zone out the people next to you and just ask the Lord to reveal what, what it is that you are hindering Him from doing in your life. How are you missing Jesus right now in your life? The story ends a little something like this. The Pharisees are mad. They're angry. They're uncomfortable. They don't like what God's doing. They don't like this guy named Jesus. They can't handle it. They, they can't wrestle with who he is. They can't control Jesus. They don't like him. And so they find the blind man who now can see. They say, hey, we are Moses' disciples. You are his. And they missed out that Moses was also his disciple. And I want to read the response to you real quick. He's, the, they, the, they, the Pharisees reviled him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses'. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Sometimes that's where our heart is. If we're being really honest with ourselves, we want to be the blind man in the story. But if we take an honest check, if we allow the Spirit to truly search us, sometimes we're the Pharisees in this story. I know I've been. I know there's ways in my life that I'm still a Pharisee. I'm still missing out on what God wants for, in my life. But I pray that the same thing the Father called out in Mark chapter 9 when He said to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, may we just be given the grace and the mercy to jump into the unknown when we don't 
we can't see the next step. Just like the blind man when he said, we know, he said, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone, anyone, opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us? Can you, heal, can you hear the pride, the religiousity of their hearts in that moment? Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and guess what Jesus does? He comes. He comforts. He guides the man to know that, that what, what he's experiencing is true. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He said, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. The blind man says, Lord, I believe, and worshiped him. So guys, let's worship the Lord. Maybe God's revealed something in your eyes. Maybe he's opened your heart to something that you need to allow him to do. Maybe today is the day of salvation for you, that your eyes have been blind. Today is the day that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you repent of your sins. If that's you, I would strongly encourage you to find a fellow brother or sister in Christ. Our prayer teams, which will be on the sides, they'd be perfect for it. They would love to pray with you, to encourage you, to help you open up that window, to allow God to move more powerfully this week than he's ever done in your life. And so, Father, we, uh, we praise you for being good. We praise you that you have a glorious will that transcends well beyond our understanding. God, we praise you that King Jesus came and died on the cross for us so that we could experience more of you each and every day. And Father God, may we never stop asking help with my unbelief, Lord, until the day that my handkerchiefs are healing those around me like Peter's. Because God, until that day comes, I've still got more of you to go for. I've still got more to sell out for. And Lord, I don't want a stagnant life. I don't want a dead life. I don't want a boring life. I want a life in abundance with you, Father God. And I fully believe that you want that for us as well. It's in King Jesus' great name I pray. Amen.